Welcome to The Private Podcast, hosted by Derek E. Silva and brought to you by Orchid, the crypto-powered VPN that keeps your data private and allows you to explore the internet freely. Hey everyone, and welcome to Private, where we plug in and explore the intersection of privacy, human rights, technology, and democracy. I'm your host, Derek Silva. Today, we're speaking with Dragana Kaurin. Dragana Kaurin is a human rights researcher and founder of the Localization Lab, a global community of 6,000 plus contributors who support the translation and localization of internet freedom tools. Dragana, thanks for taking the time to be here today. Thanks for having me. Let's dive right in. Can you tell us about the Localization Lab? What is it? It is an organization and a community. Our mission is to make technology accessible, uh, largely for the for the global south, where open markets usually don't design you know, large tech products for. So to, not just to interact as end users, but we want to build capacity locally so people can co-design and develop technologies of their own. We work through a network of 120 partner organizations, as well as, like you mentioned, we actually have over 7,000 individuals now. We work usually on, on FLOSS, free Libre open source software projects around the world, tools that provide open and safe access to information online, to secure communication tools and human rights documentation tools. And most importantly, we make these available in 221 languages. We focus on underrepresented minority and indigenous languages. We wanna make sure that these are the most vulnerable groups have access to these critical tools. Um, and are able to participate in also shaping them to meet universal usability and security needs. And when I say that, I mean that usually when we're working with refugee communities, when we're working with uh, environmental rights communities, they are speaking language, oftentimes indigenous and uh, underrepresented languages, Somali, Oromo, Tigrinya, Aymara, Quechua. So for those who are oftentimes most vulnerable to surveillance, and to hacking, we want to make sure that we're providing, we're, we're targeting them with, with security tools and making these tools friendly and not intimidating. Oftentimes means changing the design and technical settings to make sure it fits them better. Cool. That That's really important work. Thank you for, for starting the localization lab and, and getting those boots on the ground and hands on keyboards to help out with that. Do you have maybe one or two examples of uh, flaw software that the localization has helped redesign, translate, et cetera? Sure. Um, two of the biggest projects I think that we work on are Tor, Tor, Tor Project, and Signal, which is, uh, which is an end-to-end encrypted messaging app. We've helped shape these tools with feature requests, with um, oftentimes providing the kind of insight for people who are, you know, in remote areas who who really need these tools in, in you know real world situations. Meanwhile, for a lot of designers, for a lot of developers, these are still, you know, in, you know, imaginary problems. And by that I mean they've never lived in a place where there's such low bandwidth, where text messages take 10 to 15 minutes to arrive. So often as an example I use is what we've contributed, one of the things we've contributed to, to signal is we were doing what's called a localization sprint. It means we were translating all of these tools into Burmese with local groups. This was a few years ago, and one of them said, you know, I actually can't get Signal to work in northern Myanmar, where I'm at. And when, you know, when we ask why, um, among many reasons, was I can't get to the confirmation code. Most confirmation codes, you know, you have about two to three minutes to enter it for, for security, for very good reasons. But infrastructure is so poor in this area that and it, up until seven years ago, and sadly, currently on this day, 92% of the country was offline. So the telecom infrastructure has taken a long time to build for there. So when we're designing tools that are for them, that's you know for a global audience, it means we need to apply universal design. In this case, you know, it was a pretty easy fix of working with developers to apply a third party app that's secure. Um, so they don't have to wait for a text message you know, that takes 15 minutes to arrive. And you, you can use a different way to get a product to work. But it's a lot of this kind of stuff that kind of seems boring, but it can mean the world to actually making a product usable. Possibly the only example I know of of a very large uh, developed company, not that I'm a huge fan of them by any means, 
doing something like this would be Facebook. I remember a few years ago, I don't remember who said it, it might have been Mark Zuckerberg, but that they wanted to artificially limit the speeds of people using the app to give them an idea of what it's like to to use Facebook at one megabit per second or two megabits per second, or maybe even slower. That's an example, I think, of actually taking into account all these new developing markets where I think Facebook was starting to take off at the time. But the app was incredibly large to download, you know, like several hundred megabytes, which is <laughs> for some people and, you know, some people I know in Venezuela, for example, that's literally uh, 30, 40 minutes, if not longer, just to download the app. Never mind making an account, downloading all these images by default, uh, audio and video on by default, stuff I turn off because I don't want it on uh, in the first place, but I'm already in the app and I've got a fast connection anyway. I know where to where to do that. If If you can't even bother downloading the app, you can't justify downloading the app, regardless of whether it's something somewhat frivolous for most people like Facebook or something that could be life-changing like Signal or WhatsApp, having an incredibly optimized app and an experience overall for you as a Burmese person or a Venezuelan uh, can really make the, all the difference in terms of even making an account, let alone using it day to day. Yeah. To add to what you're saying, I hate to say it, but Facebook Messenger can be a life-saving app. It just It depends on your situation and it depends on making making this transparent so people understand how it works and what danger they're putting themselves in. Because we, we, you know, we keep talking about this as always dangerous, but using Signal is a luxury and we have to say that out loud. It's, it's um, being able to say, let's all quit Facebook and move to something <laughs> different. It doesn't work yeah. for everywhere. People like, especially in Myanmar have come to rely on this as a, like, as the internet, as like, because of the basic, you know, free basics program, it is the internet. And a big problem, I think, is is transparency. You can't expect like a private sector company to meet our standards as tech for good. But what we can ask for them is is more and more transparency, so that people can make these decisions on their own. You have thousands of contributors. You're you're contributing to you know apps that millions of people use uh, in the wild. What sort of impact do you do you think the localization lab has had or, you know, whether you have some anecdotal or maybe some hard data around that and going forward, what impact do you do you hope the localization will continue to have on society and, and people's lives? Well, uh, two things. One, we're hoping for relocalization. So when when, we, when, we're, when we talk about globalization that comes with the Internet, when it comes to, to technology, it's it's sort of left out there as if there are, you know, all powers are equal, but Western powers, there's still very much this colonial you know, inertia of, of supporting colonial powers. And by this, you see colonial languages are used more and more and more in the world and local languages are used less because there's just nothing available online, save for, you know, a few things available on Facebook and, or, or, you know, uh, I meant to say Wikipedia, but Facebook actually isn't wrong. <laughs> We're hoping to see more localized power, more localized like design, more respect and preservation of indigenous design, of, of indigenous innovation, um, instead of having to adopt and adapt to a Western world and the Western audience. Secondly, being in the tech for good sector, I'm just hoping for less techno solutionism. We were hoping to see less and I've worked at the UN before and have been in these rooms where people with a great amount of funding are saying, I want to find a way how to use blockchain. I don't care how, just figure out a way how to, how to use it. I want to, I want to find a way how to use drones. I read about them. It's great. We want to deliver aid during COVID-19. On paper, it sounds like a great idea, but that's not how innovation happens. That's, you know, you don't go backwards to be able to meet people's needs you need to ask the question of, what do you need and how, how to meet this on your eye level, how to meet your needs on your own terms instead of doing it on mine to make myself, you know, a great wired article for, you know, using blockchain for refugees in a way that no one will literally ever use, but <laughs> looks great on paper. But I got featured in Wired. <laughs> I know you did, but you're driving me nuts. Um, I mean, to, to give you a really quick example of this, um, I'm just writing a paper on um, biometrics on what are called refugee passports. This has been passed around so much. I mean, we still keep talking about it as if this will give, and I'm, I'm a refugee myself. 
and I work with refugees all the time. So I, I, from personal experience, I can tell you, it's not that people don't trust your paperwork. It's that they don't want you in the country. And, and that's the real issue. Adding, you know, adding an extra bit, you know, that, that, that proves that I am who, who I say that I am based on like connecting it to my iris or my facial features or my, uh, my fingerprints opens me up to more surveillance. And the thing is, when you when I've spoken to people, I should say that um, as an ethnographer, when I speak to people about this, they oftentimes are just worried about where this is going to. They want to be able to control information about themselves for security reasons. But when, when it comes down to it, the issue isn't the technology. The, the, the issue is, every single time there's a social issue underneath that we're trying to fix with technology and these are complex issues that deserve um social and cultural solutions it's great to use technology the intent behind using the technology and and probably more to your point what you do with the data after has a huge impact on how it comes across um you know how the individual being let's use the term subjected to an incredible amount of technology, perhaps after they've been walking hundreds of kilometers through the desert recently or something like that, just to get to this uh, refugee camp. I would guess, thankfully not, not having gone through this something like this myself, I can guess that that would actually exacerbate, if not re-traumatize a person, depending on the situation they've come from. Have you heard you know, anything like that? I, I do remember seeing a, a story, I think it was in Vice a little while ago about about exactly this sort of thing. Like the, it, to get an Apple or whatever, you need to scan your iris or your thumbprint in order to, to, to get this other service, literally in the exact same camp. You need to do, you know, have your your blockchain, you know, passport or whatever they've given you because they've given you a device with all this data. And like, it's not necessarily that the technology isn't great or can't be used, but like you just said, like it's it's an incredible amount of surveillance when you're literally in a fence and, you know, there's a finite amount of people there. You would think after a little while, <laughs> you know, they, they'd either be able to figure out like, oh, yeah, hey, hey, Dragana, hey, Derek. Yeah, saw you yesterday. Here's your here's your next apple or here's your next meal versus, oh, no, you're not this person. You know, you're you're trying to steal medical treatment from another person who has, you know, a certain number of credits or whatever. At a certain point, it doesn't seem helpful anymore. Right. Yeah, but uh, was it ever designed to be helpful? <laughs> I guess I guess that's the real question. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's a really good question. I wish that I had more time to look into solutions instead of I feel horrible criticizing people's you know projects that, that that are done with good intentions. But we have to we have to put a standard past like good intentions that you know in, in order to ha to get a green light to go with something. People that I've spoken to oftentimes are embarrassed, you know, to be in a store. It's not just in a refugee camp, but if they're in Jordan or Lebanon and they have to like use their thumbprint to, pe to pay for groceries, there's a line behind them. It doesn't work. You know, they, it, you have kids with you, you have, you know, your family, everyone knows you're a refugee. Suddenly there's already stigma. There's you're already being like looked at as the outsider. You suddenly feel danger. This was not designed with them in perspective. You just brought up a really good point. I don't know why my mind went to, um, my best friend, uh, when he got, God, what was her name? Julie, you know, the G GPS in the car. Oh, yeah, like yeah. 15 years ago, we used to make fun of him so much. Like he couldn't drive down the street without turning on the GPS because he relied on it so much. <laughs> um, but, but, but I think it's similar. Like, you, you know, every day if I'm coming up to get the same groceries, you would think of, right, it's it's Derek. I know exactly who it is to type it in. But you become so reliant on a piece of technology that when it stops working, it's an absolute mess. Um, and that's what, what's happened before um, in Mauritania, for example. So, I mean, like 45,000 people didn't have access to food or like services that they that they rely entirely as a person on because the system failed for a bit. And the last thing I'll tell you, I, in one of the interviews I've done, this was in, through a translator. I think it was a it was a 30 year old um, refugee from Afghanistan who had been in Greece for quite a few years by that point. And he was explaining to me his process of when he arrived and why he was in Norway and he got sent back to, to Greece. He told me they pressed my hand against this hot glass box. And I thought they were trying to hurt because, you know, so many people have abused him 
and hurt him physically on the way at borders by police, by military. This is in Europe. This isn't like far away. And I'm so embarrassed to say in my own country too. And we are like, we are still refugees around the world. And I can't believe that this is how we are treating other refugees. What I thought was so odd, like as an anthropologist was how he related to this piece of technology. It was a, it was a fingerprint scanner. And when we were going through processing, I remember being a kid and having my hands put into ink and then on a piece of paper, even then understanding, oh, they're taking my fingerprints. I don't remember anyone explaining this to us, you know, I'm sure that there is a protocol of how to explain things to my my parents, or my mom at the time, rather. But to this man, there was no information explained in Dari, in his native language. And he thought that they were trying to hurt him. And it wasn't until like years later, until he got to Norway, uh, trying to apply for local aid that they said like, oh, actually you're registered in Greece. And by the Dublin agreement, you ha- like we have to separate you from your family and you have to go back to Greece. That he, that he knew what that was. So our technical imagination is very different from, from you know, who a system like this is designed for, which brings me to ask, who are we designing these systems to work for? I have some hunches, uh, <laughs> but, I th- but I think we'll just end up going down a, a conspiracy rabbit hole rather than uh, uh, finding anything, you know, A, concrete, and B, potentially helpful just between you and I. Not that we shouldn't keep talking after this, but I hear you. It's definitely especially when it comes to security, uh, I'll call it, you know, national security, that very, very broad tent and and seems to be getting broader every day. It's probably designed with that in mind specifically and making sure that whoever gets through the national security uh, set of hoops has jumped through a sufficient number of hoops that now you can call yourself a refugee in America or Canada or, or England or what have you. So... You've mentioned a couple of times that you're a refugee. I guess we'll say, just for everybody's knowledge, from the genocide in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina at the time, correct? Yeah, I've been living in the U.S. on and off, though, for 20, actually, last month, 20, 25 years. Good for you. Was that part of what started your interest in making open source technology available to underrepresented communities, like, or, or maybe a small part or a large part um, at all? I went into study anthropology, I think, because of what happened. I've always been very interested in people and our limitations and our like the possibilities and what really happens, like when, yeah, and, and also I think why what happened happened. I've been working in anthropology in some degree, even when I was at the UN in communication for development. So understanding culturally what are the reasons that you know certain development, international development issues or humanitarian issues arise um, and how to use local values and customs for this. When it comes to technology, I sort of fell into the open source space and then immediately started seeing like the big gaps for um, who is this working for and why is it all white dudes? Um, and <laughs> sorry, and, uh, <laughs> I mean, especially, you know, in, in the tech for good sector, because I feel like it's that, like, it is a lot of white men from Bay area who have had time to make money and, you know, who have, you know, a, a source of income who, who can donate their time to develop really critical technologies. Um, Veracrypt, for example, which is software to encrypt your external hardware. It has like a secret compartment where you can store, let's say you have videos of human rights violations and somebody does your office raid in your newsroom. They wouldn't be able to see, find that in there if they were doing, if they went through all your stuff and they asked you for the, you know, the password. It's things like this, but it's always like one person that's working on it because they, um, they have the time and freedom. Why, why isn't it ever the person who is actually going through the situation? who's experiencing these issues and emergencies that that are working on them. And that's what I wanted to fix. And that's what we're working towards. I want to see more equity and who has access to the design, the decision making, and how do we get political will to make real changes? So I think this takes me to my next question in in a really good way. What do you think are some of the biggest barriers to getting equality and human rights when it comes to technology and information. We've talked about a lot of disparities here. What do you think it would take to actually, what are those biggest barriers? How do, we, do you have any ideas on how we overcome them? It's a really broad question. And to answer it, I think that we're not comfortable with giving up the status quo. 
I think we can we can keep talking about human centered design and you know new programs and applying of new technologies in different ways. But when it comes down to it, like what I was mentioning earlier, it's about people not wanting you to come in the country. It's about people not wanting you to have the same amount of money and power as I do. And I think this is really important. I say that out loud oftentimes as if like, you know, the the person who, who has power to, to, to stop that is somebody who has crazy amount of money, but I'm the problem too. I'm the person who's not giving up my seat, you know, and giving up my space for those who have less privilege to, to take it. And I'm, I work with a really great team and I feel like we're, we're constantly asking that. Is our presence somewhere um, through this work causing problems? Are we preventing locals local you know activists from taking on this work or the funding or the media attention on it i it does i feel like you asked me a large question and i said i'm the problem <laughs> but i think it, it is i think it is with all of us a bit yeah i wasn't very cognizant myself of this sort of thing uh, but exactly what you're describing probably up until a few years ago when just by listening to other people and and really putting my ear to the ground i realized yeah there's certain things where I might feel like I'm the best person for, for, you know, to handle it. But even if that's true for a time, surely to goodness, I can move on to something else. Thankfully, I've you know been incredibly privileged to, to have all sorts of opportunities thrown at me. Uh, I can move on to something else and either, you know, encourage picking a very specific person or or somebody who can help represent an underrepresented community uh, to make sure that their perspectives are taken into account or um, just not take it in the first place, right? Not take that opportunity and be like, no, you know what, this other person, it, it could be a woman, it could be a person of color, it could be, you know, some some sort of, in that scenario, underrepresented socio-demographic, you know, and, and, and race, that sort of thing, uh, to make sure that they do get a voice at the table. And, you know, in a variety of scenarios, it's, it's you know, I'm in a place where the vast majority are, are white people, or, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And so that's something to keep in mind. Or, you know, there's, or you end up being invited to what is going to be, if you say yes, a mantle, right? <laughs> Just all men on a panel, or you're constructing accidentally a mantle for your, your event or what have you. And it's just something to be, to very much be mindful of it and try to maybe take, take a step back when possible. How do you recognize that? Because, I mean, it's not just a mantle, right? It's oftentimes like an entirely, American panel who are having a discussion, but the world is watching, or, you know, it's an entirely like Eurocentric, you know, d discussion, because sometimes I miss it. You know, it, it, it's not just, you know, five white dudes talking about wanting to inspire other uh, five white dudes, but but rather it's, it's, like, <laughs> it's, it's more innocuous. How do you recognize that and address it? Personally, I don't think it's incredibly easy. Uh, I think it's very much on a case by case basis of like even when Amanda and the team at Amplified and I and a bunch of other people were putting together the panels for private, just taking a, uh, the private virtual summit that we just had in, in March, literally just taking a step back and be like, who's on this panel and why? And, you know, it was really easy to be like, oh, let's slot in this person. And then and then somebody else going like, yeah, but. Uh, you know, we don't have a single woman on the panel or we don't have, you know, this is about developing countries or or exactly the types of people you're you're trying to help. It's about those types of communities. And yet somehow we've ended up with all white people or white looking people on this panel. OK, something's wrong here. I don't think it's easy to do alone. I think at least it's much easier to to neglect on your own <laughs> if you have a colleague or a friend or a confidant who's who's you know, can help you be cognizant of that sort of thing, you know, doesn't hurt to ask for some feedback or, you know, ask for another set of eyes at something, you know, before plowing ahead on just about anything, I think just taking a step back to be like, who is this for? And, you know, what am I talking about? Or, or who's helping me talk about this topic? And and making sure you, you've tried at least and tried really hard to seek out the right people. If, if you don't have the contacts, you don't know how to reach out to, etc. Fine, but make an effort. Um, and I think a lot of a lot of conferences, especially, they just don't make the effort. They just think like, oh, well, this famous person, that famous person, this rich person, et cetera, let's all get them. They're all super smart. And then you've got, you know, four central bankers from England, Canada, U.S. and and Ukraine talking about solving problems in Africa. Like, how do 
Who does that help? Like, that doesn't help anybody. It certainly doesn't help me. I'm going to find that a lot less interesting, you know, to hear an outside perspective on solving banking problems in Mauritania or, or Somalia or whatever. Like, that, it just doesn't help. But yesterday, there was a there was an NPR article that talked about OTF, who was who's our founder, and you know an issue with with UltraSurf, which we've been talking about for ten years. I've been working in this space. You know, like the last paragraph was like, no one's ever heard of UltraSurf uh, for the <laughs> for, for the people who who. And I'm sure you can look up the, the article. It was quite a 2020 was a mind blowing year, but for many reasons. But you know, one of the analysts was like. It, it, they keep asking for money for UltraSurf for this group of people in China, but only four people in four months that we've monitored this have accessed it. And in our analysis, no one knows it exists. And secondly, it's not available in a local language. When we keep talking about, quote unquote, you know, the people, you know, users or a global market, we're still like narrowing this down, even though we're trying to solve large, you know, international problems um, when we're excluding them, you know, by design. I think a lot of like what you're saying, it comes down to like, maybe we're not ready to, you know, to maybe we're, we're ready to have like a, a diverse group of people, but we're not ready to do, any, to do anything about it. And, and that's a big problem to say out loud, to admit to out loud. I hope that's not the case, <laughs> at least, you know, even and we don't use this podcast to plug Orchid, but the team at Orchid has taken a very deliberate approach to this where, it's not available in every language yet, but we actually do involve Italian people, Portuguese people, Chinese people, Japanese people to help localize the app and and give them the freedom to not use English nomenclature or, or slang or taglines that don't translate. You know, we recognize like, you know, get started for as little as a dollar. They just don't say that sort of thing in Italy. They don't say that sort of thing in Portugal. They have similar, ta you know, taglines, other advertisers or what have you will use. And so we say, well, then use that like that, whatever you guys actually say, or, you know, what, what, what Portuguese companies say when they're trying to get that point across, use that instead. That's fine. It's, it's not a perfect, I'm sure, but you know, it's, it's at least an attempt to recognize, get started for a little, as little as a dollar just doesn't translate or, or, you know, some of the other marketing speak literally just does not translate. So do something else. And, and as a Canadian, I'm not American, by the way, um, I, we have packaging in English and French and on, on everything. And so if you actually understand just enough French to, to read it, you'll see the language understandably. So is, is very different sometimes because the English version just makes no sense in French. And so they've actually got Quebecois or you know native French speakers being like telling them like okay how do we get this point across in French and that's a very small part of it but yeah no, I was gonna say I was at a panel a few years ago for Global Voices called like you know who decides what languages you know should be accessible on the internet and the first point like we made was Canada is much better at this than the U.S. but what about a uh, you know Cree or Ojibwe or like other local lang languages. What are we doing by not, you know, creating signs in, in local languages, you know, especially on, on land where people have been prevented from speaking those languages? Again, these are big issues. But if we break this down and take them on, like what we can do as a person um, and issues we can raise as a, as a person, that's where most of the power lies. It's, you know, it's not it's not the state. It's not, you know, Facebook or a large company or a person who has the power. I think it really lies with, with individual people and what you know, what decisions we're making day to day as leaders of organizations and companies and also as, you know, people online who want to see a plural dialogue happening, right? Yeah. Different perspectives. So during the Trump administration, I think a lot of Canadians were finally exposed to a lot more border issues than they typically think about. Uh, you know, we have a largely unprotected uh, uh not entirely, but largely unprotected border with the United States, which most often works just fine. But I think a lot of issues were that that Americans have been dealing with for a while on the southern border uh, were exposed when, oh, I'm probably going to make a misstatement here, but the previous administration issued an edict or, or you know, a, an executive order that basically sought to expel a lot of individuals who were still working on seeking asylum in the U.S. 
And so, you know, all of a sudden, Canadians who were not used to this sort of thing were seeing hundreds and hundreds of people trying to cross the northern border. Obviously, Americans have been dealing with this sort of issue. I won't call it a problem because, you know, everybody, I think, deserves freedom. But this sort of issue at the southern border for a really long time, exacerbated by what I would effectively call internment camps, um, you know, where people are literally fenced up and fenced in and provided maybe barely the base, basic necessities that they need. What are your thoughts on on that current crisis at the border, especially the southern border, uh, and the ongoing struggle for uh, children and families to be reunited? Because uh, I think even now, the the previous policy of separating children from their families is still more often than not being enforced. At any point, there is no excuse for, for a policy like this. But especially for Biden administration, it's been months and this should have been addressed immediately. I think in a lot of ways, it's worse because people are coming to the U.S. now expecting there to be a different administration. The right to asylum around the world, I think, has been degraded over the past four years because like this kind of international treaty exceptionalism where America like drafts the international treaty, but then goes like, everyone else sign it, but we won't with, you know, um, Convention of the Rights of the Child. America's the only country in the world that hasn't that hasn't signed it. Like everyone oh, else abides by these norms, which it, it's re, it's called soft law, you know, because it's so breakable. When the U.S. doesn't, you know, as a really powerful country that, you know, like stands for, I mean, this, this country was like built on some extremely like racist laws and like when it comes to immigration, the Chinese Exclusion Act, like the, the Page Act, like when we say like, you know, we want to bring the country back to like, you know, the principles of freedom and things. I don't think that's what they were doing. Like, <laughs> I, I, it was, but it, it was, but for them, right. It, which is, which brings us exactly back to the, to the Silicon Valley, you know, you know, tech issue of like, I'm building software that I want, that I think would be amazing. And if somebody just happens to download it in Nigeria or, or Sri Lanka, Venezuela, uh, you know, like, what about when they use it? Is it is it usable to them? Is it is like can they actually get the app, use it in the way you intended, or are you really just focusing on the West? You know, largely speaking, you know, UK, Canada, uh, Australia, etc. One very troubling trend that I've seen is um, monitoring what are called third countries. So monitoring okay. who's entering. Mexico, who is entering Libya en route to Italy, who is entering Turkey en route to Greece. Um, same with, you know, traveling towards Indonesia en route to Australia, um, a number of other kind of wealthier countries. Um, and they all seem to have like the same people working on them. Celebrate as a company is monitoring mobile phones of who's entering these third countries looking for patterns and behavior, maybe what, what they're searching for. They have access you know, to, to their uh, social media. None of this is, is legal because it's not I mean, common, but because it's not happening on U.S. territory and because, and because it's not happening to U.S. citizens, no one is challenging this. And so organizations like Mi Gente, like, w which are working on the border, they have like limited resources. So it's really like up to ACLU and... And, and others too. And I really wish that they would do more of this, of advocating for digital rights of asylum seekers and potential asylum seekers, because what they're doing is they're looking for people who might be entering Mexico, who are exhibiting behavior, like, you know, going towards the US border and preventing them from seeking asylum, which is, which is a basic human right. Another thing that's happening right now that, that honestly, I cannot stop thinking about that breaks my heart is, in Denmark, um, Syrian refugees are being returned. And this goes against what's called the CAT, the Convention Against Torture, Article 3 of Convention Against Torture, of, you know, you cannot return somebody to their country of origin if there's a credible threat of them being tortured again or, or, or to, you know, to be imprisoned against their will unlawfully. And that's exactly what's happening with a lot of these, you know, political people who have been activists against the Assad regime and yeah. have now built a life in Denmark. And I have family actually who escaped to Denmark and were held in detention facilities with like, there's just no sunlight, like for up to a, more than a year, I think in one case, 
I keep being like, it's far away. And, you know, I don't want to curse on your show, but Denmark, like, I cannot believe that this is happening and who locally is speaking up against this. But it's because of us. It's because of like what's happening at home that we've like degraded this, this like really basic and I think sacred right and the right right to, cl- to claim asylum somewhere because your life is, is threatened because, you know, and in many cases like mine, when you leave your home, lines are drawn up and it's, you know, the country is cut up and doesn't look the same anymore. And you don't have a passport mm-hmm. anymore because the place doesn't exist, you know, where, where you, you used to come from. So when, and another troubling thing is during the Trump administration is when they started taking away citizenship from people. So, so for somebody, you know, who, who had a Yugoslav passport, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, yeah. When you're taking away like citizenship, you don't have anything. And it puts you in the worst position imaginable when it comes to your rights. Cause you have no one, you have no country to appeal to, to protect your rights. Like it's really bad. And we keep, I keep seeing horrible examples far away, but I think it's because we've let things get so bad here. And like there's abuse of, you know, quote unquote, our digital bodies of information out there that, that's about us that would never happen to American citizens. Like that, that would never happen like on American soil. But because it's far away, we're preventing them from even coming here, even making their case for asylum. Don't really have anything to, to say to that. I don't laugh because this is funny. And that's this is something I'm, I'm just you know, taking over from Alex is some people are going to have to learn about me is like, this is more like a, like a, a nervous, like, oh, shoot, I don't, I don't know what to say next. So I just kind of chuckle when that happens. Like now I don't have any sort of analog, you know, in my personal life amongst, amongst my family, like my family is, is all immigrants, but it was very much a, I mean, they, they were able to afford or, or a family member was able to afford plane tickets, you know, to leave Portugal, come to Canada, not that their life was easy, you know, for the next 40, 50 years, but certainly much better than it would have been otherwise up until very, very recently, uh, uh, you know, like maybe late 90s, early 2000s, things started to kind of catch up and, and be similar, you know, quality of life to Spain or or England or what have you. Not that I don't appreciate hearing the story and, and trying to think about what that struggle might be like. I just, I just don't have an analog. So I think, I think that's part of the problem is that it makes it really hard for people to try to identify and have any sort of empathy for what it must be like to be them. And I use that word them very much in that, in that case of like, I don't know what it's like to be a Christian fleeing from a Muslim country or vice versa or to be the wrong tribe, quote unquote, and having to deal with the, uh, you know, a, a genocide in Bosnia, Herzegovina, or South Africa, or a country in Asia that's that's escaping me right now. But we just we just lack the ability, whether it's it's on purpose or not, to to really sit down and be like, oh wow, that must have been horrible. Yeah, of course you deserve asylum. Of course you deserve, you know, another chance at at having, you know, building a a good life for yourself. Instead, I, you know, I hear people say things like, oh, well, you know, there's a black family driving a really nice Lexus SUV. Oh, it must be nice getting all that money from the government. What? Like, did you look up how much money, you know, asylum seekers get for a period of time from the Canadian government? I can promise you it did not afford an apartment and a Lexus SUV and whatever lu- other luxuries you think they're getting. Like it's it's just, there's this complete disconnect. And I think that's probably one of the biggest problems we would need to overcome. Me having been born here and, and, and you know, and, and raised here. But like just, people just don't bother to to think or or to look up like, oh, is this crazy scenario I'm thinking of in my mind? Is that even possible? No, it's not. OK, never mind. Maybe maybe the you know, maybe the, the adults in that family are doctors or what have you like. Or some of them might be like losers like me who are not contributing to society whatsoever. <laughs> but the point is, we still deserve asylum because, you know, I'm definitely not the successful child in my family, as I'm sure if you have immigrant parents, it's a similar situation where it's constantly <laughs> being pitted up against each other. But but we, I still des- deserve mercy. I still deserve basic rights, like claiming asylum. And I, I don't have to be good. 
I don't have to be a doctor. I don't have to be, you know, contributing to, to society in great ways you know, for this. But you bring, we have, a, we have a term for this, for what you said, called the Schrodinger's immigrant, which is uh, <laughs> one that it's uh, coming to steal your job and it's also really lazy and doesn't oh, want to yes. do any work. Um, it's a mystery how we, you know, make it happen. I think a big problem with this is the narrative because, you know, it gets so lost. I've been, I've been watching uh, the show Exterminate All the Brutes by Raul Peck, like the Haitian filmmaker on, on HBO that kind of goes into colonial narratives of like the myth of, of the U.S. and, and of, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of European countries and how colonial histories kind of just get swept under the rug. You know, we were just mm-hmm. talking about a lot of these issues, but it's really important. We're talking about people coming to the border to claim asylum to also say we caused these problems through the war on drugs. Like I, I genuinely, I wish that, and I, I'm committing to this personally from now on, when I'm talking about this publicly from now, from now on to also say this together, to give some cultural and historical context, because people aren't just, you know, fleeing in a vacuum on their own. There are power, like right. powerful countries are, causing problems like these and we're not doing anything about it. And when we're taken to court, read Nicar- Nicaragua for causing, you know, problems like these and, you know, the U S then just like left the ICJ instead of uh, paying or admitting to the fault after the, you know, international court, right, court right. of justice ruled America was guilty for this. They were just like, we're actually going to leave. Um, it's been fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank, you, thank you for the feedback. It's like me getting feedback on like a employee, or, you know. Uh, for, thank you so much for the feedback, but I just don't think this is for me. The other thing I was going to, to say earlier that's really important to remember: immigration is going to go up, like significantly, yeah. and we're going to see a shift very soon where people want immigrants. I know it sounds nuts because of you know xenophobia and populism that's happening around the world, but we should be thinking about this now, especially in terms of technology, so that we're not causing abuse, you know, in, even inadvertently, that we're not causing mm-hmm. um, spaces for abuse. Because in OECD countries, Japan is a really good example because you, you you see like an older population and you see birth rates going down. And you see, there, there's a big need for regional people to be coming in to, to provide provide care. What is that going to look like, especially in, in an information age where so many jobs are being automated? How do we create space for e- equality so that we're not throwing all kinds of work to, to people who have various degrees of you know migration status, but rather that they have equal opportunity to complain about their rights violated, that they feel safe, they can do that anonymously. These are all things to think about now when we're designing systems going forward of, of who's left out, who who is potentially going to be at risk because of, you know, this innovation, you know, or this new system we're designing. Or climate change or like, you know, islands literally disappearing in the Pacific Ocean uh, because water levels are rising or tsunamis are getting worse or that sort of thing. I'll just mention two things there and then we'll move on to to another question. The Canadian government recognized quite some time ago that and even under a conservative party that, you know, we needed more immigration. So we did have about a uh, 100, maybe to 150,000 immigrants coming in per year. And then the Liberal Party uh, was voted in, in 2015, and, and they're still hold power now. And they literally doubled the eligible number of immigrants because the Canadians who already live here, regardless of race, creed or anything else, weren't making enough babies to replace or to grow the population in order to pay for all these social programs we like to have. Can, uh, Canada Pension Plan, employment insurance, uh, you know, health care, uh, you know, or I'll call it socialized health care because it's not truly universal, but socialized health care. We need the money to pay for this stuff. Therefore, you know, it, and it's got to come somewhere. Either things need to get cheaper, uh, especially devices we buy and, and services we provide, which generally is not happening uh, unless it's something that's been around for a long time. But, you know, GE and Siemens keep coming up with great new hardware that costs double, uh, you know, the amount that the last one costs. Or, yeah, you need to re- not replace, you need to grow the population somehow. And so well, how do you do that? Well, you, you take people who want to come to your country and want to be Canadian or American or British or what have you, hopefully have some skills, if not, are willing to learn some skills. And and you do your best, you know, what, whatever that means to bring them in, accommodate them, 
teach them what it's like to be a Canadian in 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 all well, all the good, hopefully not the bad, because certainly we have a colonial past as well, you know, and move forward. When I've heard this, not an analogy, I guess it's an analogy of America being the melting pot and Canada being the tossed salad, where you actually get. You know, and, and New York has this sort of thing, but uh, as well, and I'm sure lots of other uh, cities like uh, Los Angeles and other, you know, any big city with with a decent number of immigrants from one particular place will have the Portuguese village, Little Italy, you know, Chinatown, etc. But even those places in Toronto, which historically for me even was like, oh, cool, I'm in like a, you know, I'm not in China, obviously, but wow, like all the signage has changed, you know, the vast majority of the people around me are Chinese or Italian or what have you, or Greek town. And and you you get a sense of what life was like for them back home, right? Uh, where they've come from. And they've tried to recreate just a little of it here in Canada. And even those somewhat arbitrary borders, but recognized and celebrated in those cities are starting to break down where, you know, Portuguese village... Eh, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of mixing going on now with uh, Chinese people opening up stores or, or people from the Caribbean opening up their own restaurants and stuff like that. Personally, that I think that's great. There's nothing absolutely wrong with that. But even for the people who came here and like, ah, I'm going to build a new life and work, I'm going to live amongst a bunch of Portuguese people, you know, that's starting to change for them. And, and you know, they're older now or, or you know, realistically, a lot of those immigrants are now passing away because they've been here for for decades. When you talk to those people, I occasionally I still hear that like, oh, but this used to be like this and you just used to be like that. Like, yeah, but things change. And these people deserve a place to open up a business and serve some food and and make a living just like you did in 1974, whatever, you know, whenever you came over. I highly suggest going to the Tenement Museum in New York if if you ever get to travel mm. again, if we are ever able to go with planes and go to Canada and vice versa again, which, you know, went through this waves of Irish and, you know, immigration and then uh, yeah. a large, you know, uh, uh, German and Russian Jewish population, Italian and, and Puerto Rican. So like all of these like tenement buildings in Lower East Side that went through waves and saw a lot of changes. And I always say, whenever I get so frustrated with being like a tech anthropologist, I'm always like, I should have been a culinary anthropologist. If I could only <laughs> just go back and find some money to like, to study how tomatoes came from like Central America to Italy and became so ubiquitous and potatoes and spices. I'd love to, I, I just want to travel around and have someone's grandma cook for me. <laughs> <laughs> somebody's grandma a greek grandma a, a chinese grandma yeah i just let's just give this up and open a restaurant you know what more meals together cooked by somebody who really knows what they're doing and which is probably somebody's old grandma or aunt would probably just bring us all closer together so that could be a, a really good part of the uh, of the solution okay we are way past time here so i'm <laughs> i'm gonna try and give you a couple of quick hit rapid fire questions here and see if we can wrap up, maybe on a positive note. What dangers does border surveillance present right now? And maybe on the flip side, are there any sort of positives that you can you can think of? Uh, border surveillance. Honestly, I, I, I can't. You, know, you brought up national security earlier, and I feel like we keep leading with this, even though there's a very low threat for people who are actually coming to claim asylum. I think a far mm -hmm. lower threat when it comes to crime than um, because of such thorough and increasingly bigger background checks. Because here's the problem, Derek, everything that we're testing out on people who don't have any rights, this is gonna to come to bite us in the ass any second now. Mm -hmm. if, we're, if we're not stopping this or what's happening to people who have no rights, have no one representing them, no one to protect them or to represent them in court, this is what's going to happen to other people in the country. And it has, that's always the case. So license plate readers tracking people around the country, Palantir, so large private companies like Palantir working with ICE. Meanwhile, Palantir is also working with World Food Program with other people, in, you know, 82 million people in the world who need food and are relying on this large global organization. Meanwhile, they're, you know, working with the U.S. to kick people, other refugees, you know, out of the country. We need to design systems to work to protect people. And, and transparently. And we, each of us need, needs to be vocal about this to a degree to make this known. I, and I'm not just saying as Americans, like this, this needs to be, this needs to be a global issue. 
not just around less less surveillance, but more, around more transparent policies and where, where they're getting their data from. It's just every in every way, the system is stacked up against you and it's going to hurt all of us. I've made the case before, mostly about the U.S., but also about Canada and, and other Five Eyes countries, more or less, about the fact that uh, I don't think it's right to enter another country and you know tell them what to do and how to live and et cetera. Meanwhile, we've got all these problems still at home, right? We have poverty. We have all sorts of criminal issues, which largely stem from, from poverty and lack of opportunity. And yet somehow we think it's cool to invade other countries or, or bully them into doing things certain ways that no country is perfect, obviously, but exporting democracy has largely failed realistically. And yet somehow we still, we still think it's like the best idea. You need to do things our way and then everything will be fine. And I think we found really starkly, especially over the last 15, 20 years, that it really, really does not work. It never worked before, but I think we have so much additional press coverage and and access to information that we've seen, you know, that sort of model, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, et cetera, just fall on its face over and over again, either because they don't want it or the system we think they should adopt and the way they should adopt it just doesn't work culturally for the most part. Uh, or because, you know, more or less they feel like it's it's been forced on them. I don't know that it's so cut and dry anymore. You know, thankfully, opinions can change. You get new information, et cetera. Uh, it might be a little bit more nuanced, but I, I, I think it still applies that if you don't have your house in order, it's it makes it really hard to justify telling somebody else how they should be living their life or how they should handle their borders and that sort of thing. And so, uh, you know, when your asylum seeking process or immigration process can be seen to be incredibly um, discriminatory, I think it just makes it hard, harder for, for the countries who think they're doing it really well to, to go to other ones and be like, guys, you know, can, can you just, can't you just let all these Syrians in? Can't you let, let just let all these, uh, uh, you know, Sri Lankans into Australia? Maybe they could, but nobody's really got it figured out of, how to do it well? Like, how do you have any ideas on how to how we actually do this well? Like, I, I agree the the asylum seeking process can be incredibly invasive, sometimes laughable because you know you're you're vetting a newborn. What's a better way to to actually make this work? I think the system is in place for this to work very easily. There's no reason why not to uh, you know take in large groups because you just mentioned that Canada just did that. I don't know how much vetting, you know, I actually happened like, I, you know, there's you you literally need to need to apply from home. Right. So if you're living in Libya or Italy or wherever you need to apply from home, there's a process, you know, there's there's a skills uh, assessment system, basically, to to make sure that when you come, you can actually start contributing to society right away. Um, it's it's actually a fairly high bar. Asylum, I imagine, is different. But on the, on the, on the immigration side, the opportunity is there. But, you know, there's a fairly thorough process from what I've been told. Uh, and the bar is actually set fairly high. Like I said, it's different for asylum seekers because you literally need to just get out. But I, from my understanding is most of these applications need to happen from where you are. So, you know, you might be a Kurd who's ended up in Turkey and, you know, you're applying from that refugee camp. Most people are going to be living in what's called a protracted refugee situation. So 78% mm -hmm. of people around the world are going to be living in a place for 10 plus years. These are tent cities where you have no infrastructure, oh. nothing. And we keep talking about these places like they're just temporary. That's for two reasons, because host governments don't want you there. And they keep hoping you will just go home, wherever that might be. And secondly, mm -hmm. because organizations like NGOs and like UNHCR, they get their money, their business model is... I know this is going to sound awful, but their business model is to keep more people in tent cities, like to keep more people reliant on their aid. That's how they get more funding. We have to challenge these systems. We have to we have to keep talking about things in context and creating, I think, a different precedent for how we're addressing these issues. You talked about digital democratization. The myth of digital democratization, just to go to circle back to what we we're talking about first around Tor, we, we work on 81 different projects. 
a lot of them get, you know, funding from governments with the ideology of spreading democracy, you know, through technology. It's BS. You don't, you don't spread democracy through. If this is how globalization works, do you think that we can see in Canada how people are getting healthcare and we're, we're, we're asking for it more? I'm not being cynical. I'm just asking the question, you know, what are called second generation human rights. So the right to healthcare, the right for your government, you know, to, to you know, demand of your government to provide disability care for you if you get hurt at work so that you're not relying on insurance for this maternity mm-hmm. care, paternity care. Those are all kind of second generation human rights that are not present in America whatsoever, but they are very much in like former USSR countries, for example, very prominently in, in a lot of like uh, non-alliance movement countries too. Does it work like that too? Because people who we've interviewed who use Tor, one who is based in China, like very early on one of our interviews, he said something like, this is marketed to me as if it's like a tool that's going to help me overthrow my government. He was being quite serious. Like he, he was being like, you're being ridiculous about this. And he's not wrong yeah. because we keep pushing an ideology with the technology and it doesn't have, all we're doing is alienating people with like, with circumvention tools like this, even open source, like well-intentioned stuff. He said like, this makes me feel bad for being Chinese. It makes me feel bad for, for like not trying to, you know, cause a political rift here um you know and he was trying to say you are talking about this in a very irresponsible way that you should be creating Mm -hmm. technology that i can adapt this on my own that i can use it to access to gamble online to buy stuff online to watch cat videos to i don't know go go on pornhub do whatever you want i don't you don't necessarily have to go on human rights watch for you know for me to feel good about creating technology that helps you access what you want to on your own terms how, how you want to talk about it Are we also seeing how people are being taken care of in other parts of the world? And therefore, we are. Is that how globalization works? I don't know. Um, That's not that's not the way it's worked so far. I think the way way it's worked so far is Coca-Cola made a really good business over here. And now we want to make a really good similar business over there. Right. So it's very much been at least from my perspective, very profit motive. And that's where Coca-Cola usually hires people like us to find how do we market tools <laughs> locally. Um, but I'll just say it now, that theory of change is flawed. And we've seen that over and over again. Uh, I do agree that anytime, if you're going to position something as like, you know, help, help youth overthrow your government, you have really missed the mark. You know, whereas the far more important messages there is cover your ass or access the entire internet so that you can actually see if you want to, and only if you want to, how other people live, what life is like in in another country, any other country, doesn't matter. I, I'm just going to stop naming countries because I'm going to just end up naming the same ones over and over again. And as daunting as it was, you know, even in the 90s to be like, oh my God, I have a search engine. What do I search for? These people are going to have, I, I have to have, I imagine, the exact same frame of mind of like, what do you mean? Like, what do you... What, what am I not getting access to now that I should be getting access to? You know, there's all sorts of, of answers there, depending on where they live, what kind of censorship they're being subjected to already. Uh, I've had, <laughs> you mentioned Pornhub earlier. We've had people from Southeast Asia come to us before being like, oh, so I can watch porn now. Yep. If that's what you want to do, go for it. Because they can't. And, and regardless of their rationale for doing so, I don't care. Their, the point there is they don't have access to the whole internet. This tool, whatever it is, Tor, Orchid, another VPN, uh, or you know, a proxy tool or whatever, this will help you overcome that barrier that you're currently experiencing, that you're expressing an interest in overcoming. Great. Then yes, you should you should use this tool and let them figure out organically what other things they can use it for, given their context and situation. A couple of years ago, during the internet shutdown in Zimbabwe, mm-hmm. platforms were like were you know cut left and right. People couldn't communicate. Activists couldn't communicate. At one point, someone like created a meme. So we're working with with people locally to provide them with tools very quickly in Shona and in the Valley to make sure that they have things so they can communicate despite, you know, this heavy censorship. 
um, I got a message saying like, we're finding new and creative ways to communicate. And he's like, pretty sure we're gonna, if Pornhub had a chat function, we would be on there communicating. And I was like, oh my God, it does work like this. I mean, I'm, I'm joking obviously, but um, <laughs> it's funny. Like what are the interesting, because we put millions and millions of dollars into like infosec and, you know, digital democratization <laughs> technologies. And, and when, when everything failed, people would get creative. They're like, I don't know. Does it have a chat function? Can I send news on there? Yeah. Can I can I post something and tell people I posted something somewhere and maybe what my username is and they can go find it and or like on what video I've commented on and they can go find it and respond. Great. That's really all I need. Right. So there's there's all sorts of more sophisticated ways to do that. But yeah, you can literally just take over somebody's platform temporarily. And I hope, you know, uh, that that those platforms just kind of let it happen. Like if if you think maybe somebody's using your platform to to bypass uh, something that you, you know, in your heart of hearts think they should be able to do, just let it go. Okay, let's let's end off on on this question because I think it's really important. You've been to all sorts of countries. You have probably encountered this yourself, uh, you know, in in your travels. You know, needing to to use extra tools to to communicate or bypass restrictions. Uh, so what I'm really curious about is how do you protect your privacy online? Despite the fact that you think you you're not contributing to society, and maybe your your parents don't see you as excess, I vehemently disagree. Can you talk to my but, mom? You know, I'll no, just set, set, give me I'll a letter I'll send you my phone number. You can. I'll give you my phone number. You can tell her to call me. <laughs> um, but you know, given the work you do and, and the places you've been, I'm wondering how do you protect your privacy online? It's an interesting question because we work with so many people who are high risk individuals that I have to have a number of different options and two phones to be able to communicate with them. So, and that didn't happen immediately. That took a long time Mm -hmm. to figure out. I can't tell them to meet me here. I have to meet people where they're at. I use Signal. I've asked just about every group that I was ever part of in in WhatsApp and and Viber to, to help move over. And that took after a while of helping shape signal into being able to, you know, respond to individual people in a in a in a group chat and getting comfortable with with a tool like this. When I'm traveling, I uh, I use a VPN. I've worked out of places like Syria, like uh, when I worked at the UN. Um, in some cases, when you know you're being monitored, you can't use Tor. Um, sometimes it's safer to self censor, and by that I mean don't look up certain things and Mm -hmm. that's an extreme. And that's one thing that I always advocate to people. It's a headache, you know, this like really techno solutionists, like, you know, saying, and one of my friends, Natalie Marshall, she wrote her doctorate uh, with this title, use signal, use tour. Um, Cause you you know, you hear this all the time. It doesn't work for everybody, Um, but we should be providing people tools to to use it. So, So really I use everything just depending on the situation. I like using Tor. It makes me feel really good that I'm participating in something and that the more people are on there, the more anonymity it gives, and more validity it gives gives people. And that's that's not just Tor, that, you know, as us, like, anonymous, like, blobs in a space. It's also, <laughs> um, like, human rights documentation tools. The more we normalize these technologies, like open source, secure technologies, the more easier it is for people who go through, like, checkpoints I'm quite serious. I've seen this many places around the world who have people who have their phones taken and, you know, for someone to look through. So Signal doesn't look suspicious so that, you know. It's just chat app. Yeah. Or something like Camera V that was, you know, designed by, you know, our friends at Guardian Project to to be able to film police encounters. Sorry, what was the name of that app? Um, So it's it's been adopted a few times. It was Camera V. Um, which puts a geo stamp and a timestamp on um, on videos. We have a whole on our website. We have a whole list of different tools that that we work on and that we have worked on. But Guardian Project is one of our favorite nonprofit partners. But yeah, it's, I think I think a big part of it is normalization, like, and a big problem I think is is us and the way that we talk about these tools in a really intimidating kind of way. How do we make it friendlier? How do we make privacy? How do we make digital security? a conversation that we can easily bring up with our friends and family instead of getting an eye roll, a long protracted <laughs> eye roll at the dinner table every time. The Ghana, not again. Like, come on. <laughs> 
All right. Well, I think that's a at least slightly positive note to end on of of the, the localization lab. Given you know you giving a really strong example uh, of the types of tools uh, that you've helped contribute to you and and all your thousands of contributors and, and your team members, and encouraging everybody to really just have that conversation with your parents and and other family members of like, well, you know, you don't all you don't always need to use that web browser. Yeah, like I use I use Firefox with the Facebook uh, uh, container on and stuff like that. And I feel much better at the end of the day, checking Facebook maybe once a week and just knowing that at least the vast majority of those cookies are not following me everywhere. Dragana Kaurin, thank you so much for your time today. You've been incredibly generous with it. And I hope everybody really enjoyed listening to us uh, have this chat. This was so much fun. It was such a wonderful chat. I'm looking forward to, to chatting some more eventually. Thank you. Thanks so much. You just heard the private podcast with your host, Derek E. Silva. Remember to subscribe to the show on Apple, Spotify, Google, or your favorite streaming platform. New episodes available every Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in.